This conversation with former Supreme Court Chief Justice Conrad Mallett Jr. is part of the James J. Blanchard Living Library of Michigan Political History, a project of the Michigan Political History Society. I'm Bill Ballinger, and I am pleased to be able to interview former Justice Mallett, who is with us in his office. Justice Mallett, let me start out asking you, you are Conrad L. Mallett, Jr. I am. That means there must have been a senior. There's a senior, and there's also a Claudia Gwendolyn Mallett, my mother. My parents, Bill, are, oh, excuse me, were political activists. In the late 1950s, my father was a part of any number of progressive political organizations uh, with persons like Coleman Young, John Conyers, Richard Austin. My mother, interestingly enough, was a part of an international women's group called Women for Peace. In 1959, she went to Russia. And on the Kremlin Square, she and 10 other women from the United States actually marched with signs that said, end racism and ban the bomb. They were arrested uh, and promptly sent back home. At the time, I was six years old, but that was the milieu within which I grew up. My father had gone to college with and pledged the same fraternity that I'm now a part of with John Conyers. When John decided to run against Richard Austin for the congressional district, uh, the first congressional district, my father was his campaign treasurer. It was a purely insurgent campaign. Uh, the UAW was on one side. John Conyers, his father was a member of the UAW, was with his son, but not a part of the establishment. Uh, and they won that race by about 150 votes. In 1964. In 1964. So at that point, Jerry Kavanaugh was getting ready to run for mayor and looking around for people to assist him in his insurgent effort against Mary Annie. Uh, John recommended my father. My father turned out to be uh, an asset to uh, uh, Mayor Kavanaugh and became a member when Kavanaugh won of uh, the mayor's executive team, uh, turned into a senior member of Mayor Kavanaugh's executive team, was the first black housing director of the city of Detroit, the first black transportation director in the city of Detroit, went on to get his PhD, became a senior vice president at Wayne State University, one of the founding educators who created the Wayne County Community College under then the leadership of uh, Dr. Murray Jackson. And my father's career with John Conyers, with Coleman Young, with Malcolm Dade, with Bill Beckham Sr. and Jr allowed me, really, to be an upfront participant uh, uh, in all of the political activity going around uh, in Detroit. And the interesting thing for my father was, was that I was interested in it. I was with him a lot. Uh, he would go to a meeting, I would go with him. I mean, this is the way that my father and I connected. He was a really, really, really hard worker. He didn't have time to come to my games. He didn't have time to come to school functions. That was largely uh, the responsibility of my mother. But when my father went to political things on Saturdays and I wasn't otherwise occupied, I went with him. Uh, and, and, you know, I turned into an asset to the old man. Sixteen years old, when he was running for Rain County Commission, I was his campaign manager. Now, let me be clear. I didn't do anything other than what he told me to do, but I was in charge. I mean, I had all of the details responsible for the filing, for being sure that all of the finance reports were done. Now, he would check them, but it was basically me and him. I, and and it, was, uh, it was really, really excellent training. And as it turned out, not only was I interested in it, I was good at it. I, and, and that kind of transformed into a career. Uh, for me. I was a frontline participant in political elections from the time that I was 16. And between my mother and my father, you know, my interest in politics was always real, was always upfront, uh, and always substantive, uh, and, and which really shaped 
uh, my participation socially. For instance, as a lawyer, you know, I mean, I, I guess I, with some small regret, say now that I never participated in uh, state bar politics, well, because my own view was, was that I was participating in real politics, the politics that meant something to people beyond just lawyers. So, you know, I mean, the, that, was, that was the Conrad Mallet, uh, Claudia Mallet uh, influence on their son, Conrad Jr. When did your mother's and father's family come to the Detroit area? Man, that's a really interesting story. My, 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 my mother's father and my uh, uh, grandmother on my mother's side are both from Virginia. They initially were in Chicago. My, my mother's father, Charles Jones, has, was always an entrepreneur and had a taxi company uh, in Chicago, four cabs uh, uh, that he cobbled together. Uh, when he refused to pay protection to some other nefarious organization, they basically blew up one of his cars. He then moved his family to Detroit, started another cab company, and so he had a cab company. Was this company. like in the 20s? This was, yeah, my mother was born in 1929. She moved here when she was five. So in the, in, in the, in the early, yeah, 30s. early 30s, so, the, 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 uh, so he had a cab company, a little real estate company, uh, so he owned three or four houses, he had two or three cabs. He was always producing for his family of nine. My mother's existence with my grandmother and grandfather really was, as much as it could be, idyllic. Uh, she really, really grew up in a stable environment with a hard-working mother and father uh, and with nine brothers and sisters, really a storybook in terms of the quality of her existence. My father's existence is also storybook, but as he would describe it, Bill, Dixonian. Uh, my grandfather was killed uh, in front of my father, and he was eight years old when they were living in Houston. Uh, he saw his father die. Uh, he witnessed my grandmother uh, have a nervous breakdown, and because she was black, received no mental health care at all. He observed her pull herself together um, never quite completing the repair process. Uh, my grandmother, who I loved desperately, was always a little bit uh, on edge. Um, my father uh, is, is, is 6'2". All of the men on my family, on my father's side of the family, are my height, about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, the Lord made my father taller so that when he would apply for a job, he could lie about his age. Uh, he came to Detroit by himself when he was 14. My grandmother sent him here, supposedly built to live with a family that was supposed to greet him at the railroad station, who never came and who never ever bothered to find out where he was. This in the 30s too? This in the 30s too. So the old man then checks himself into the downtown YMCA, lying about his age, enrolls himself in Miller High School, and think about this, Bill. The old man had a perfect attendance record. And it always stunned me and my sisters. How did my father figure out that school was going to be his exit ticket out of this ferocious, unrelenting uh, poverty that was overlaid with this crisis of dysfunction? Uh, when he graduated from high school, joined the Army, this is a true story. So he, in the, in, in, you know, the Army was segregated then. So he go, gets sent down to Florida. They are taught then as black troops, they're going to be responsible for uh, uh, making airplane t uh, runways. And they're supposed to be going to the Pacific. The Army being the Army, his group ends up being sent to Alaska. Uh, Russia began shaking their saber, and so we decided that Russia was going to attack us from the north, so we had to build uh, 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 runways in Alaska so our planes could land to confront the Russians, who we were certain would be coming over the Bering Strait. So it's freezing, and the sergeant comes up and says, who knows how to drive this asphalt machine? My father raised his hand and says, I do. And he said, you sure? He said, absolutely. He said, but Sarge, let me ask you, can you give me the manual? I just want to review it. I haven't done it in a couple of years. 
Father never ran an asphalt machine in his life. Memorizes, memorizes the manual, gets up in it, and then spends the next 18 months with his shirt off in the uh, running this asphalt machine. Everybody else freezing to death. He's sweating. <laughs> and, 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 you know, as he says, you know, listen, we made, I made the very, very best of a terribly bad situation. People were getting frostbitten and everything like that. And my issue always was, was I was, was, was coming out into the cold after sweating uh, uh, up in that uh, hot cab uh, for eight or 10 hours uh, a day. So that's just, that tells you, Bill, who the old man is. I mean, he does a fascinating character, really, really, really ferocious in his discipline, exceedingly smart. Uh, uh, devastatingly well read and a very very serious man believe me did you have any brothers or sisters I got two sisters my sister my baby sister Veronica is a physician she's the chairperson of the OBGYN department for the University of Texas at El Paso my sister Lydia is a, uh, a PhD uh, uh, industrial psychologist from Michigan State University and she's senior vice president for human resources for DuPont were they interested at all in politics no, as you no, were? No. You, you were the guy who got the political gene. I was. I, I got the political gene. Okay, so you're 16 years old. What, are you going to Cast Tech at that I'm time? Going to Cast Tech at that time. That's exactly right. Okay, and then so you went up through the Detroit public school system. What other schools did you go to? Over I started time? out at McCullough, right. um, and then the, the, uh, uh, my mother insisted that we go to Catholic school. Uh, so we went to St. Gregory. From St. Gregory. Were you with, Catholic yourself? And still am. Yeah. Okay. And, and 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 now that I'm approaching uh, now in my 60s, uh, I found myself back in church a hell of a lot more than I had <laughs> been in the past. Um, but the the yeah. So we were raised Catholic. My father is Catholic, but, and, and, and both my mother and father are Catholic. Um, so we went to Catholic school, St. Gregory, the Visitation. Uh, and then uh, we went to Durfee, which was our introduction to. Uh, at the Detroit Public Schools. Uh, it was a great time for me, not so great for my sisters. All three of us went to uh, Cass, uh, which was obviously one of Detroit's great schools then and now. So you got out of Cass, and then what? Got out of Cass, graduated in 1971, and my father refused to allow my mother to fill out any of my college application papers. So the only one that I filled out was Wayne State. And the old man came to me one day and said, are you going to college or going to the Army? And I said, no, no, I'm going to college. And he said, well, where are you going? And I said, I got a letter from Wayne. I'm going to Wayne. And so I started at Wayne, stayed at Wayne for two and a half years. You know, at Cass, I was at Cass with uh, George Cushenberry. George and I were both at Wayne together. Uh, uh, and then after two and a half years at Wayne, I went to UCLA, uh, got up one morning and now, said... Now, why would you decide to go way out to California? You know, I think that I had kind of outgrown the moment that I was in. I was really looking for something different, and I really wanted to see if I could find my way on my own. I knew kind of, Bill, what I wanted to do, which was be in politics, but I really wanted to be in politics on my own terms. You wanted to put a little distance between yourself and your very and my father. overbearing father. or Whose shadow was really, really large. Long. Yeah. yeah. It, the, the, and it's not so much that he was overbearing in terms of his relationship with me, but he just looms so large. There was in so this much city. to live up to. No locally. question about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. you wanted to create your own. Get some distance. Get, get some, some air. Distance. Get and, some air. And go see whether or not what I was made of. I and and went to UCLA, graduated, did very well. Um, and what and, were you uh, majoring in? I had been majoring in political science at Wayne, found it really boring, uh, switched mayors, mayor, ma majors when I got to UCLA uh, and graduated with my Bachelor of Arts in English, and very happy. So then what? You get out uh, get California? Get out, come back home. Came back here. And, and, the, and got a job, uh, one of the most fun jobs I've had in my life. I was a congressional assistant in the district office to John Conyers. 
Now, this is 1976. Fred Harris is running for president. He was a U.S. Senator from Oklahoma, and running for the Democratic nomination. Exactly. Uh, the traditional Democratic Party uh, uh, had mostly thrown some of its way to Utah, and Coleman Young and a lot of the political leadership in Detroit had determined early on that they were going to go with Jimmy Carter. John didn't find either one of those alternatives uh, uh, to his liking, and he decided that he was going to go with Fred Harris. So during that year, I traveled with John, and my responsibility basically was, was to carry his bags, and I was a great bag carrier uh, and, and really facilitated his travel from one place to another. He was a principal speaker for Fred Harris all over the country. Uh, and I went with him all over the country, and it was a great thing, uh, and, we, and we both had a hell of a time. And uh, Fred Harris fell short of getting a nomination, obviously. Short. Jimmy Carter <laughs> won the nomination and, yes. and was elected president. And was elected president, yeah. right. Okay, right. well then, at that point, you decided to continue your education? You know, I mean, I mean I'm on the road with John. John is, it, John and I are very close. Obviously, he's close to my parents. We've known each other forever. He was in college with my mother and my father. Uh, uh, and so I'm in constant conversation with him. And John Bill had always been one of my idols. And he was a lawyer, and I wanted to be a lawyer. And John said, well, when are you going to go to school? And I said, well, next year. And he said, yeah, you know what? That's a good thing. And so he... Uh, the, the administrative assistant in Detroit then was somebody that you know, Nelson Saunders. Sure. Nelson, uh, John directed Nelson to assist me in the whole law school application process, uh, wrote a, uh, a terrific letter of support, uh, and the uh, young lady that I was uh, going out with then was from Los Angeles, and her brother, Tommy, was a really important person on USC's campus walked my application into the dean's office. And as he says, he didn't have to do much, but he did walk it to the front of the line. The dean saw it, liked it. I got admitted and uh, uh, went You to, had to go at that and, 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 and had to go. <laughs> there, were, there were no impediments. And what can I say? The, uh, it was a great, great time. L.A. is the best town in the world to be a student, and particularly a poor student. Santa Monica Pier, then you got a dollar, you can get on three rides, and you watch the sunset into the Pacific Ocean. You know, if you can't get a girl to girl to go home with you after that, you know, you just really not, not, should not be in the game. Well, now, University of Southern Cal versus UCLA, Trojans versus Bruins, when they face each other on the gridiron or the basketball court, who are you rooting for? So my girlfriend then was a Trojan, so I always, so I'm a USC person. My, 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 I love UCLA for what it did for me. Uh, but, you know, remember, I graduated from Cass Tech. Then, when I went to school, Bill, our sports programs were terrible, except for the swimming team, which I was a part of. But we would go to the football games just to see what the score was going to be. We, I remember when I was in 12th grade, we played Northwestern. It was 52 to nothing. <laughs> So I never developed any real school spirit because I was never a part of a winning tradition. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm an itinerant sports person. I read about it, you know, I will, I will watch it. Football on Sundays is an excuse to take a nap, you know, I mean. So when I, I see you on Mondays, I can talk to you about the game only because I got up at 4.30 and read the free press. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you graduate uh, from law school. You also, did you get another degree too? Yeah, so uh, USC then was one of the few schools. There are a lot of them now. But then they had a dual degree program, master's degree in business, master's degree in public administration. I got my master's degree in public administration believing then that I was going to be uh, an elected public administrator. So I wanted to be well trained, and I was. Came home, uh, uh, passed the bar and uh, bided my time volunteering in John's office 
uh, hoping that there would be a vacancy on the Judiciary Subcommittee of which he was a part. This is he, like 1979, This 80. is 79. This yeah. is November 79. I came home, took the bar, didn't do anything other than study for the bar. And then when, after I'd finished taking the bar in July, I was volunteering in John's office, kind of hustling around, doing filings for, for, for lawyers, not really doing anything and hoping that there would be a vacancy in John's Washington, D.C. office. Remember, Peter Ordino was the head of the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee, but John was the vice chair. So he had five or six slots. They were all filled. He was pretty sure one of the young people were leaving. I was waiting for them to go. Malcolm Dade, who was the chief executive assistant to Coleman Young, and this is about the time that Jimmy Carter obviously is up for re-election, calls me and says, come with me to D.C. I'm going to be the deputy campaign manager for Carter. I want you to come with me. I got nothing else to do. I take a job uh, at the Democratic National Committee as a member of something called the political division, which my father always laughed at. He said, Any, isn't everybody at the DNC in the political <laughs> division? And I, yeah, I say, OK. So anyway, so I go there. Malcolm arranges it so that I get sent to the state of Mississippi. Uh, and become the uh, person responsible for managing the get out the vote effort. Was uh, that for the whole South or just for the no, state of Mississippi? No, just for the state of Mississippi. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we had a really good team. Uh, you know, it's a great, great time to be someplace else with a law degree, member of the bar. Uh, now suddenly I'm, I'm thinking that if we win the election, Malcolm will be in the White House as one of the executive assistants and I can go and work for Louis Martin, who liked me, who I knew, who Malcolm had a very good relationship with. So I said, oh my God, I'm gonna be an assistant White House general counsel. Carter loses, Malcolm calls me up. He says, listen, turn in all your expense reports and make the treasurer of the campaign pay you right then. Because tomorrow morning, we're telling everybody no more bills are paid. So I go to the guy that night and I say, listen, and his name was Paul. I said, Paul, can you, he said, oh, Conrad, I'll take care of it tomorrow. I said, no, really, you know, I'll take care of it tonight because I'm leaving in the morning. So he said, okay. So he took care of it that I'm sure that I was one of the last bills paid. So I took my $400, got a plane ticket, came back home. Malcolm went back to work for Coleman Young and I joined the law firm Miller Canfield, Paddock and Stone. Uh, and it was a great decision. I worked for one of the great, great, great lawyers in America, Stratton S. Brown, who had helped write all of the uh, public financing laws that existed in the state of Michigan. Now think about this. That's 1981. What happened in 1981? Coleman Young, recognizing that the city of Detroit is on the verge of bankruptcy, decides he's going to go to the state legislature and ask for an income tax increase. And then he's going to have to have that request uh, confirmed by the people in the city of Detroit. Mal uh, uh, Coleman Young says to Malcolm, you have to run the campaign. Malcolm said, I'm too old, but I got somebody who will do it for us, and I will control him. Uh, and already I had a reputation for being kind of out of control. And uh, 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 the mayor said to uh, Malcolm, in front of me, this kid is 27 years old. You're going to put the entire fate of the, of the city in his hands. He said, OK, good. Both of you uh, are going to be held responsible for this if it doesn't work. Uh, we had a group called, remember these guys, John Martilla, Tom Kiley, Martilla and Kiley? Absolutely. They were our political consultants. Okay. And then they came up with vote yes, which was like really Think about it. I mean, that's, that's, that, that was the essential requirement. And we ran this really, really great uh, campaign. We won handily, but with, we worked our brains out. And right after that, uh, when we won that election in November of 1981, a young congressman uh, who had participated in the bailout of uh, uh, Chrysler decided he was going to run for governor. His best friend, then and now, was a man by the name of Ron Thayer. 
Ron Thayer was very close and had been very close to Malcolm Dade for decades because what? They both worked for Frank Kelly. Uh, okay. Malcolm, Ron Thayer went to uh, Malcolm Dade and said, we need a deputy campaign manager along with Rick Weiner and a young woman by the name of Ellen Globacar. And who do you recommend? Malcolm said, I recommend Conrad Mallet. I met with Ron, Ron and I, then Ron took me to meet with Blanchard. I go back to Malcolm and I say- Was that the first time you'd really met Blanchard? First time that I had yeah. met Blanchard. We liked each other, but remember, you know, my political patron is Coleman Young. So I go back to Malcolm and I say, listen, what do you want me to do? And Malcolm says, we want you to do it. And I said, well, is the mayor going to endorse uh, Congressman Blanchard? He said, not right now. I said, well, what am I doing? And he said, well, you're, 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 you're going. And I said, oh, I'm the peace offering. I'm, I'm, I'm the stake in the ground. I'm, I'm, I'm the mayor's indication that things are going well. And if they really go well, then the mayor will come. And if they don't go really well, the mayor will won't, won't, won't. And the only thing you sacrificed is me. And Malcolm <laughs> said, you know, Conrad, I couldn't have said it any better. And so uh, I start out then uh, uh, as the mayor's stalking horse, his representative in the campaign. But it turned into something different because, you know, Bill, in order to do something like that, I mean, you're, 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 you're a senior member of the political class and elected yourself many times. You got to throw your whole heart and soul into it. You can't halfway do it. If you halfway do it, you lose. So, you know, man, what happens is you, 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 I was with Blanchard every Sunday. He and I went to two or three, three or four churches every Sunday, uh, really starting in, in, in July, uh, excuse me, in June of 82, just really getting out there and meeting the people. And remember, Blanchard's a kid from Ferndale. And he had no affiliation or association with Detroit. Um, but let me tell you, man, this guy really, really, really turned out uh, to have an affinity uh, for uh, 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 the people that he met. He, he enjoyed that church experience uh, and, and looked forward to it. I'd never had to drag him. He was always anxious to get in and, and, and hear the music, participate with the people, stay for breakfast. Uh, it was what we did all day Sunday, from 8 o'clock in the morning to about 2. You really come to understand who somebody is when you're in a, uh, you're in a car with them, you know, for, for six hours. And Blanchard and I, man, you know, really established a very healthy respect for each other, which turned into, man, a real love for each other. I mean, Blanchard is one of the most important people in my life. Uh, I love him to death. I'm really, really more than pleased to be associated uh, with him. And what happens is, is that the campaign began to take off. We were better at it than everybody else. You know, Rick Weiner uh, was, was terrifically uh, 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 gifted in, in political science. I mean, he knows the game. Ellen Globacar is one of the great political operatives that ever came. Uh, and, and on the edges, we had the entire Coleman Young machine, which really wasn't with us because the mayor hadn't pushed the button, but they were almost with us. And, they, and people assumed the mayor was going there because I was there, and they assumed that the mayor was going there because Malcolm kept showing up. So it, it was really turning our way and becoming something very, very special. Well, you had to win a big primary first. Big too. primary. You had yeah. like six opponents, didn't yeah, you? Seven yeah. of you all together. Ed, uh, uh, Ed Plowicki, Gary Corbin, had a lot of big names out right. there. But no, the the the. But Blanchard clearly was the leader of the pack basically from the first day. Right. But we had to clear it out. Uh, and, and, and it was, and had to do it in a way that the party wouldn't be fractured. But, you know, it was, it was, it was, it, we had to prove ourselves. Yeah. I mean, so you won the primary and then you're facing Richard Headley, the author of the Headley Amendment. Tough that election. Was uh, passed by the voters in 1978. Right. And uh, 
November uh, 82, you were still on board, still, still doing you know, the Now I was full-time. The mayor called me, you know, I called him the old man. The old man was all the way in. Uh, when Brickley didn't get the Republican nomination, Headley beat him in the primary. Headley beat him in the primary. Coleman Young then said, okay, uh, I'm pulling out all the stops. So now the entire Coleman Young machine, which really was at its zenith then, uh, was available. Uh, and and uh, Jim Blanchard got uh, 390,000 votes out of the city of Detroit. Yeah. Crushed Dick Headley. Yeah. But the, the, it was close everywhere but Detroit, and Detroit really delivered. And it was surprise, surprising the ferociousness of the turnout. The old man, uh, that last month, was with Blanchard in church every Sunday. This is Coleman Young. This is Coleman Young. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was with him every night. So you think about this. Jim Blanchard and I had been going to these churches, you know, and I'm driving my little, literally driving a, a AMC Rambler. <laughs> <laughs> well, George Romney would have liked it. And, and, and I love that little car, man. And the, uh, but when the old man came, Blanchard's sitting in the limousine with the old man. We're running, we're running red lights. We, we got an entourage, man, you know, of 10 cars. It's like, yeah. the, like the president showing up. Sure, absolutely. And the old man was at the zenith of his power. So he walks in with Blanchard. I mean, you know, the show stops. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the great scene that I remember, we were in St. James Missionary Baptist Church, and the Reverend James Nix, God bless him, passed away uh, um, uh, soon thereafter. One of the great church musicians that the world has ever produced. On a par, and some of your uh, uh, particip viewers will know this name, Kirk Franklin. On a par, Bill, with now Kirk Franklin. So we're in St. James Missionary Baptist Church. On the stage is Don Regal, Coleman Young, Jim Blanchard, uh, John Dingle, John Conyers. I mean, we the, the whole the whole aristocracy mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party is in this church. Mm -hmm. So James has really got it going, man. The whole church is rocking. Everybody's clapping, and and Don Regal is offbeat. <laughs> Jim Blanchard <laughs> turns to him, and the whole church is watching and gets him on beat. On beat. Man, wow. listen. Impressive. The house came it, down. They really... It just, it just, <laughs> just the house came down. <laughs> and then Blanchard turns back around, man, and this is a song he knows. Yeah. So he's singing and he's clapping and he's just having uh, the time of his life, man. And I, I will always... Uh, remember, remember that, that scene. Always. Okay, always. so Blanchard beats Headley. He's elected governor. He goes to Lansing. You go to Lansing, right? I go to Jim Blanchard now. Remember, he's 40 years old, and he really rolls in, man, with the Kitty Corps. I'm 29. I'm his legal advisor and his legislative director. Bob Bowman rolls in. He's the state treasurer. He's 27. His deputy is Jay Rising. He's 26. The, the um, uh, I mean, really, uh, Lawand was 39, he was the chief of staff. I mean, we, 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 we were yeah. really, you know, we were coming to take Lansing. Rick Cole was with us. Sure. Uh, we were coming to take Lansing uh, by storm. And those first couple of years, man, we had a ball. Uh, well, now, it was were a great you time. living in Lansing? Or living in Lansing. You, you, no, you were I lived in Lansing. Lansing. Lived so in you're Lansing. up there for two years during the, the start of the Blanchard administration. Right. So you didn't stay there indefinitely, though, did you? No. The, Your role was what? You were general counsel and head of advisor. legislative affairs? Exactly, exactly. So okay. it was a great job. The, I, I always remember this. Frank Kelly came to see me and Blanchard, and he called me, always called me Connie. He said, Connie, you know, the, 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 this legal affairs person ain't much of a job. And Blanchard's the governor, man. He's sitting at his desk. Kelly and I are sitting on the other hand. And Stan Steinborn, remember Stan? Oh, yes. Love yeah. Stan. Absolutely. So Stan's with him. Yeah. And so it's the four of us in there. He said, it ain't much of a job. Really ain't much of a job for you. Because you know, the governor's legal advisor is the attorney general. And Romney had a legal advisor. But he and I came to an agreement. 
that the legal advisor to the governor would be sworn in as a special assistant to the uh, attorney general. Oh, okay. Right. So he said, raise your right hand. And he swore me in as a special oh, assistant, really? okay. as an attorney general, thus idea. allowing me to be to remain the governor's legal advisor, with allowing Frank to uh, not maintain the fiction, but to always say, he said, "No, no, no, I'm the governor's legal advisor, and one of my guys, Conrad Mallet, is in his office." And what I did, actually, though, was take that. Uh, opportunity very seriously, and I met with Stan three times a week, and we, Bill, went over everything. Why not take advantage of one of the greatest lawyers the state of Michigan ever produced? Why not give the governor the best legal advice that he could get? So I began most of my sentences when it came to be giving James Blanchard legal advice with I talked with Stanley and we agreed. You say that to any elected official, I talked with Stanley and we agreed. <laughs> that's, that, that's a very powerful recommendation yep. that what you're about to say is the right thing to do. I talked with Stanley and we don't think you should do X or Y. Well, that's a really firm no, don't do it that way. It was, it, was, it was great. I mean, I, I, I took Frank at his word. I was proud to be one of uh, the Attorney General's special assistants. And uh, uh, the, my relationship with Stanley Steinborn, uh, really, man, was one of the most important relationships I've ever had in my life. Let me ask you one question. One of the first things that confronted you was the terrible budget situation yeah. in 1983. And you were Director of Legislative Affairs, and as you know, in the spring of 83, there was the fateful vote on raising the state income tax, right. leading eventually to recalls of two Democratic senators late in the year yeah. and Republican takeover of the Senate with a new majority leader named, I hate to say it, John Engler. John Engler. And uh, guess what? The Democrats have never regained control of the state Senate. How do you look back at the decision then on raising the state income tax, the recalls, and what happened? Two things. I think that if the governor were sitting here, he would agree with me that we had no choice, one. Two, we also did not fully understand the necessity to reform the government. I mean, hindsight being 2020, what we also should have done was really examine how the state of Michigan was doing business and really take John Engler at his word that we were spending too much money on things that were not adding value. Uh, the, the calculus was, was that everything that we were doing was right. Uh, the governor was uh, having grown up in a single parent home and been poor uh, a large section of his life was not interested, Bill, in getting rid of general assistance. He was not interested in, in, in cutting people off. Uh, I think were we to be confronted with it again, we would have sought humane ways to modify the program. But nobody had that much insight into it then. And none of us knew that the economy was as fragile as it was and never really would return to this this boom time that we were used to. Uh, and, 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 and finally, I think that uh, uh, we anticipated um, uh, uh, the loss of Phil Marston, uh, who went on to become the superintendent of schools. Uh, Blanchard uh, always held him in very, very high esteem. It was the hardest thing to do. We knew that uh, he was one of the two Democratic the senators two. who was recalled. Right. And, and the loss of the Senate uh, Then complicated the, the rest it, of our it, lives. It, yeah, it did. No question it, did that it. help maybe facilitate your decision to leave at the end of 1984 and no. come back to Detroit? No. I was, and you will understand this analogy, when you're a member of one political family, you're always a member of that political family. Coleman Young called me and uh, actually uh, sent Malcolm Day to see me and the governor to say, look, uh, we got a tough race coming in 85. 
uh, we really need Conrad to come home and manage this, and we really need him to come home now and put everything that's in pl that needs to be in place. So, it 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 was a directive, and I think that the governor and I were both sad, but there was no point in getting a, starting a war with Colvin Young over me saying, well, I'm not going to go. Uh, that would have injured the governor, that would have injured me, that would have strained the already fragile relationship that Blanchard had with Coleman Young. And I wasn't sad, Bill, to leave uh, or sad to be going home. I just, it, it was part of my responsibility as being a, 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 a senior member of the team. And, 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 and so there was an, another set of responsibilities that I had to carry out. And, and so the, Okay, so uh, you came back and you helped Coleman get reelected. Right. And then what? You know, the campaign was over. The mayor had been reelected. You know, the whole Tom Barrel thing for all of us had been a real strain. I mean, as much as people wanted to write him off, Bill, he ran a fairly decent campaign. The election outcome was never close, but, you know, remember he demanded a recall. It was just a lot of stuff with this guy and, and really frayed everybody's nerves. And, and so when it was over, and if we got done with the campaign right around Christmas time, uh, I was really looking around. Uh, I had kind of come and done for the mayor what the leadership of the, of, of, of the city political machinery had asked me to do, which was be sure that the mayor got, got reelected. Uh, and I didn't think I had much of a contribution to make to the mayor anymore. And uh, so when I told him he was leaving, you know, he was, a, he, he when, was sad to you see were leaving. that I was leaving. <laughs> he was sad to see me go, but only a little. <laughs> Uh, he gave me a party at the house. He gave me a resolution and, and all of that. I had Conrad Mallet Jr. Day, and all. So it was. Well, a, a, I think a, he probably really did. A miss perfectly you. appropriate send off. You um, wanted to stay on your good side, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so and you we went off into the private went sector. To, to, uh, so I joined Tom Lewand at Jaffe Rate, okay. and um, um, he had started a division at Jaffe Raid, which had not done public finance law before, a public finance department, which I joined. Uh, and we went in and, and we were doing really good work. We had obviously municipal clients who needed to work with the state of Michigan. Uh, uh, Ed McNamara had just been, uh, had just been elected in, in re, was it re-elected or elect? I think it was re-elected in 86 or elected in 86. It was elected in 86. Elected in 86. Taken over for Bill Lucas. That's it, right. To, taken over for Bill Lucas. So uh, uh, then, you know, I then meet uh, one of the great friends that I developed over the course of time, Mike Duggan. Mike Duggan hires me and Luan uh, to work with him uh, both on the public financing associated with getting Wayne County out of debt and to help manage both the governor's office and the legislative response to Ed McNamara's request that we raise uh, parking uh, 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 fees and hotel fees in order to uh, uh, help Wayne County get out of its then massive $400 million uh, budget. So we do that, do it successfully, kind of starts me and Lawand off in a really, really positive uh, note uh, Wayne County stays a good client of the firm. Ed McNamara and Mike Duggan stay really good personal friends of ours. And we're floating along. And I don't, and floating in that we're doing the job of lawyers. It's not overly exciting, uh, but, 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 but we're both building uh, a small amount of our personal net worth. Uh, my family was very young then. So, you know, we're working hard, following the American dream. Things are going fine. Governor comes up for election uh, in in uh, eighty uh, in in eighty nine, right? Eighty eight, ninety, ninety. We all get the feeling that this is going to be tougher than anybody had anticipated. You know, the governor had gone through some personal changes in his life. Um, uh, uh, the Martha Griffith thing had not been handled well at all. Uh, we she was the lieutenant governor. She was lieutenant governor, and we had we had anticipated that Mrs. G was simply going to step down, and we were going to give her a huge party and a wonderful send off. 
Uh, and Mr. G uh, determined that no, Martha should stay as long as Blanchard. And Hicks, that's, Hicks Griffiths. Hicks Griffiths. One time chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. And a Party. very, very, yeah. very ferocious, important thinker and a really great man. But you know, the truth of the matter is we had a plan. Our plan was to change the face of the governor by introducing as his lieutenant governor, Bob Bowman. That was going to be our big shift toward youth, toward vigor, toward new ideas. Uh, when that didn't happen, we stumbled. Uh, we stumbled pretty badly. And then the Republicans, through some operatives of theirs based in Detroit, were able to uh, convince the mayor to kind of sit on his hands. Not a lot, but the mayor didn't bring the kind of enthusiasm to, to Blanchard's reelection as we needed. We ended up, as you know, losing that election by 17,000 votes, less than one vote per precinct, and clearly all of that turnout could have come from the city of Detroit. Um, I don't blame the mayor completely. It was a poorly run campaign. I won't name the names of the people because they're still stumbling around here trying to do political work now. <laughs> they ain't good at it now. They weren't good at it then. Um, and we were very, very, very profoundly disappointed. On the Supreme Court then was uh, Justice Dennis W. Archer Sr. Um, having witnessed the confusion that occurred when Blair Moody. Blair Moody back in 76. So yeah. Dennis then, when, the, when, the, when Blanchard lost, immediately resigned from the court so that Blanchard would have a clear window within which to make the appointment when he was absolutely unequivocally still the governor. So, man, you know, I mean, there was furious jockeying, and uh, I remember the phone call from my father. This is in December of 1990. This is November. November. November of 1990. November of right 1990. After the right after the election. Right after the election. You know, Dennis resigns, and... Because uh, he's getting ready to run for mayor. Getting ready Detroit. to run for mayor, and he wanted to be sure that Blanchard, as the governor, had an unquestioned ability to appoint his replacement. Right. So he exits... There's a vacancy. Uh, the jockeying begins. Who are some of the other people being considered, do you think, at Most that time? directly being considered. Remember, there was a list of names that were appointed. I was on it. A brilliant uh, uh, jurist by the name of uh, Cynthia uh, Stevens uh, was on it. Uh, Adam Shakur, who was uh, then, I think, the deputy mayor for the city of Detroit, but had a, been the a chief, judge. Uh, chief judge of the 36th District Court, was on it. And Ernie Lofton, who was the regional director 1A for the UAW, very powerful, and Coleman Young were supporting Adam Shakur. My name was on the published list, and my father said, you know what, it's a great thing. And I agreed. There was a great thing to be mentioned as a possible candidate for the court. And Bill, I swear in a stack of Bible, I thought nothing more about it. It's good to have my name on the list. Thank you, Governor, for thinking about me. I was moving on. I mean, not moving on. I wasn't paying any attention. <laughs> you know, it was, Christmas was coming, and yeah. I, I had things you to had do. Other I wasn't to do. paying you any attention. You were practicing law. Everything to this was going at all. Well. And the Governor, uh, I know now and did not know then, was furious with everyone. He thought that. The people who were closest to him uh, institutionally could have done more. The UAW could have done in more. His re in campaign. his reelection. In his reelection. The UAW could have done more. The mayor of Detroit could have done more. And whether he was right or not, he was feeling uh, like people that he had helped, people that he had protected, people that he had supported, had not given him. Uh, of the support that he deserved. So there was a gap uh, that existed between now the people who were supporting Adam and the, the, what the governor himself was interested in doing. And the, 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 as, as both Ron Thayer and Tom Lewan tell the story, they were sitting with the governor and the governor was saying, man, oh man, I really am betwixt and in between. Adam is perfectly a good choice. Uh, he's qualified, 
good guy, I know him, I like him, but I don't want to do it. And Ron Thayer and Luan say to him, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, what I really want to do is appoint Conrad. And Luan says, well, you know what? You ought to do what you want to do. And Thayer says, I've been saying that to you all day long. You ought to do what you want to do. Uh, and the next thing I know, completely out of the blue, I get a phone call from the governor that says, I'm going to appoint you to the court. Where were you at that time? I was at home. I was living uh, in West Bloomfield. I got the phone call. I'm sure it was a weekend. I can't remember, Bill, if it was a Saturday night or a Sunday night. Whatever it was, we both knew that the story could not be held. So we went to Stephen Cooper's court I think that t following Tuesday, so it had to be a Sunday, following Tuesday to afford the announcement at 10 o'clock. And we made the announcement. Uh, the governor then gathered up his family, went to Washington, kind of halfway done at that point, kept his address in Michigan, but gathered up uh, uh, his team and he left to Washington. And everybody associated with the Blanchard campaign kind of flew to the four winds and you know uh, I'm standing there now uh, as a member of the Michigan Supreme Court <laughs> and both my father and Jim Blanchard say to me these this two years on the court will be great for you it will solidify your career it'll be a great thing and um, um, why two years because neither one of them thought I could get elected. <laughs> and you had to run for election to fill out the unexpired portion of the term of Archer right. in 1992. And, and they you, thought you weren't going to be able to be elected uh, in your own right. Well, let me ask you this. Why did they have that kind of reaction? What was the reaction in your mind to your being appointed by Blanchard to the court at that point? Unanimously negative. <laughs> Every what? newspaper in the state. On what grounds? That I had never been a trial court lawyer, that I had never been a judge, and that I was too young. All true. Uh, the Detroit News called me Blanchard's Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the... Well, uh, what did that do to you personally? You know what? It was a great and profound moment because when I was on the phone with uh, uh, um, a Rick Weiner, um, and Rick called me up and said, "Listen, you know, I see all these editorials." And he said, "But remember this: next week they'll be on to something else." <laughs> and sage and, and, advice. And he and he said, "So I'm not saying forget about it." I'm saying understand that they'll be on to something else. You'll be fine. So the next week, New Year's Eve, they were on to something else. <laughs> and then the thing that I don't think that either the governor or my father really appreciated was, was that although I had never been elected, I knew what I was doing. My swearing-in ceremony was at the DIA. I had Carl Marlinga, Stan Steinborn, Frank Kelly, Damon Keith, Coleman Young, um, the prosecutor from Genesee County. Weiss. Weiss, yep. Bob Weiss. Yep. I had uh, the president of the uh, uh, state bar. My cousin Leslie was the president of the Wolverine Bar. I had Wendy Baxter, who was the chief judge of, of the recorder's division of the Wayne County Circuit Court. These people were all on the stage. And there were 1,100 people at the swearing-in ceremony. And Hugh McDermott, who was sure. your good friend, yep. and a political writer, a columnist for the Free Press, came and wrote about it and said, don't count this kid out. 
There's 1,100 people there on a day when it was a terrific ice storm and people really had to labor to get there. Uh, he said 1,100 people, there, wasn't a, there was standing room only. Uh, all of these people were there. Uh, I, he says, you know what, I'm not a fan or a supporter. All I'm telling you is, is don't count this kid out. And that was his column, and that was the start. And from that point, from the swearing-in ceremony until the date of the election, I averaged one campaign appearance a day. Uh, and, and Somewhere and in the state. Somewhere in the state. The next month, in February, I flew to the Upper Peninsula. I was there for a week. Um, and, and as you know, you only get credit for going to the Upper Peninsula in the winter. They don't care if you come in the summer. That's right. when everybody comes. Yeah, exactly. You've got to come when there's 23 inches of snow on the ground <laughs> and the high that day is 10 below. <laughs> then they will say, I'm, we're glad to see you. Right. So I went to northern Michigan and did two days of a teach-in kind of thing as a guest lecturer because, you know, the, the, I was notorious. I was, you know, this brand new 37-year-old member of the Michigan Supreme Court. And people wanted to see, you know, what, does he speak in complete sentences? <laughs> and, and, and so I had a ball and, and I campaigned uh, my, on my desk, on, on the, which we uh, cleared for this interview, is a picture of me and my then three-year-old you know, at a campaign event. She's got on a pair of sunglasses and I'm lecturing away, campaigning my brains out. And that's what I did. It was a, it was a family job. That's what we did for entertainment for two years. Um, and you remember, Bill, surprisingly, against Michael Talbot. Right. Uh, a, 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 a okay, judge of profound. Before we get to that, before sure. we get to that, you're a member of the court. Yes. You walk in there and you've got titans. Yes. Surrounding no you. You've no got question. Charles Levin, you've got Bob Griffin, Jim Brickley, Dorothy Daddy Boyle. Comstock, Riley, Patricia Boyle. Mike Cavanaugh. Mike Cavanaugh. Those were your colleagues. Those were my colleagues. How did they treat you? Dorothy Riley, next to my mother, is probably the most important woman in my life. Dorothy, when I got appointed, said, uh, I've only met Conrad once, but he certainly seemed to me to be a nice young man. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it, and, and so she gave me as much of a positive endorsement as she could. Mm -hmm. She was always gentle, she was always graceful, and she was always supportive. My office in the Detroit uh, office that we had was next to hers, and I would sit with Dorothy uh, two or three hours a week, you know, half an hour here, 45 minutes there, every, every day. Uh, she was just a really, really, really important member. Senator Griffin, um, a very senior member of the court, long career in the Senate. When I walked in, he said, listen, you'll be all right. Never forget. Your primary responsibility, your sole responsibility, is to protect the institution of the court in the things you write and in the way you behave. You never forget that, you'll be fine. Brickley, who had his own complicated uh, career, uh, was just, you know, I'm glad you're here. This will be a lot of fun. Kavanaugh knew my father when my father was, uh, you know, going to get Mike out of trouble that he had gotten himself into when his older brother Jerry was the mayor. Right. So Kavanaugh said, listen, the whatever I can do, you let me know. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, the, I owe your father a tremendous uh, debt that I've never been able to pay. And so I'm going to do everything I can to take care of you. Chuck Levin thought I was hysterical. <laughs> um, in what way? In, 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 in that I was just so junior but so opinionated, you know. And, 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 and Boyle was interested in the fact that 90% of the time with criminal law matters, I agree with her and not Chuck. 
<laughs> and I always came in, and the bill, the one thing that, the other thing that I recognize, in addition to having to do the campaign work, the other constituency group that I had to satisfy was, as you anticipated, the members of the court. So unfailingly, I was prepared. Without question, I had read everything. Without a doubt, I had written my own fact statements. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I don't write the opinion. I write the facts. The facts dictate the result. I write the facts. I hand the facts to my law clerks. They come back with the result based on my interpretation of the facts. I, that's what I did. I wrote up the facts. The law clerks would come back. We would go over the analysis. And I really, 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 like Patty Boyle and Chuck Levin, uh, could take a lot of pride in the fact that most instances, more than 50% of the opinion that got produced was my own. Chuck and Patty were more like 75%. Um, uh, but my direct personal contribution to the work that got published uh, uh, in a very large instance was my own. So the intellectual integrity associated with my work product, the people on the court understood and appreciated. So, you know, I mean, they saw me as a good colleague. They saw me as a responsible colleague. They saw me as a prepared colleague. And you felt colleague. welcomed. And I felt very welcome, very welcomed. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I was always a little bit of a disappointment to Chuck Levin because I, I had shaded uh, to what he called the right with uh, Patty Boyle. But man, think about this. You know, two of the smartest lawyers that the world has ever produced, Patty Boyle and Chuck Levin, arguing over issues associated with uh, 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 criminal procedure, uh, really trying to uh, knock down drag out over Miranda and what did it mean. And, 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 and if the police knows that a lawyer is in the waiting room and while the defendant hasn't asked for him, the mother has sent the lawyer there and the police know the lawyer is there, but they let the kid go on and waive his rights. Patty said, what are you talking about? It was free and clear. He did it on his own. And Chuck said, what are you talking about? The police knew that the lawyer was standing in the hallway. The, if they had said to the kid, the lawyer that your mother hired is here, now do you want to waive your rights? He just said no. So, I mean, that's actually a closer call than you think. In that instance, I agreed with Chuck, but easily, you and Patty wrote a profound opinion, which went the other way. They said it doesn't make any difference. No one tore his fingernails out. No one caused this young man to... Uh, do anything other than freely waive his rights. Who cares what he knew or didn't know? That's not the standard. The standard is, was on his own volition, did he waive his rights with no prompting from the police? What are you talking, the police withheld from information. They do that all the time. Cut it out. Uh, and, 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 I mean, you know, so you, you this, this is, so on the court itself, I mean, so you think about this, it's like a ping pong. We're both doing this. Everybody's moving their head from side to side, waiting for Chuck, waiting for Patty, waiting mm -hmm. for Chuck, waiting for Patty. Uh, it was always, man. I mean, you well, know. Well, what were some of the other big cases that you can remember? You know, I mean, a huge case. Butson and Nevers. You know, and this yeah. one, I, people ask Starsky me. Starsky and Hutch. Starsky and Hutch. Malice yeah. Green. Malice right? Green. That's all that. And, well, tell, and Tell us a little about that. Well, you know, Malice Green was the young man who had in his hand a bolus of, of cocaine. And uh, 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 Officer Nevers and Officer Butson were... We're Police, Detroit police Detroit officers. policemen who believed that uh, if they could open up his hand, they would have evidence associated with the fact that he had committed a felony because he had in his, in his hand a large, not large, but he had enough cocaine in his hand that would have caused him to be at least indicted for, the, for possession of a, a felony amount of cocaine. So in the process of trying to open his hand, he was killed. And so the question is, is during the course of their trial, for whatever crazy reason, the bailiff goes out 
they're on break, and he gets the jurors a movie. What's the movie that he gets them? Malcolm X, starring Denzel Washington, produced and directed by Spike Lee. Six of the members of the court all say that the fact that this was a, a, a movie about a very important, uh, but also very radical, member of the African American civil rights community, uh, could have had the potential to politically inflame the jury. And thus, their initial uh, decision to find them guilty of second degree murder. This is the jury. This is the jury. Yeah. Was unfairly influenced by the fact that they had watched that movie. And I disagreed, and it was six to one. This and is a, on appeal. This is this to is the on, Supreme Court. Michigan Supreme Court. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so it's on, on appeal. I can't remember, my, uh, the, the, my supposition is it's very, very likely that the Court of Appeals overturned their conviction. Uh, I came to the Supreme Court. We heard it because it was a very important case. And the court, six to one, in fact, ordered a new trial. My own view was, was that, uh, frankly, um, I, don't th I didn't think the movie was important well, enough. Let's make it clear. Nevers and Budson were convicted by the jury by the in jury. the original trial. That's right. And so the Supreme Court's basically overturning this and saying there ought to be a new trial. You were the lone dissenter. That's right. Okay. That's right. And my own view was, was that, frankly, the movie was not strong enough. And I remember my clerks, because I wrote a, wrote a really uh, harsh critique uh, of the movie. And my clerk said, you, Justice Mal, you can't put that in there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not enough of a basis to uh, say you don't want to have a new trial because the movie was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to be, you were a film reviewer Monte. I was a, exactly. Yeah. And part of my argument was, was that this was really a fairly poorly constructed movie that didn't have as much social revel, 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 uh, relevance as Spike Lee thought that it should. And because of its gross deficiencies, both in fact development and personnel development, I didn't think that the jury would have been overwhelmed. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't quite say they would have been bored to death, but I didn't think that the court's uh, uh, suggestion that this one movie would cause them to forget eight weeks of fact presentation made by the prosecutor uh, uh, was valid. The great thing about being on the Michigan Supreme Court, all of my colleagues read my dissent and every single one of them sent me notes that said, you need to strengthen this, you need to cut that out, you need to make this better. I'm not sure what you mean here. I think this would be better said this way. Every member of the court contributed to my dissent, recognizing that I was going to be by myself. Dorothy particularly said, it's got to be at the best opinion you have written, and we're going to make damn sure uh, that it is. And when Dorothy said something, man, on that court, everybody paid attention. And so I think, uh, uh, I think she was the chief, but anyway, she kind of made it the court's assignment. I want you to review Conrad's dissent. I want your best clerks to go over it. I want substantive comments delivered to him by X day. And Conrad, I want you to read them all. And I really, really want to see evidence of the fact that every single one of the suggestions that got made have been clearly and appropriately considered. So it was like, we were like high school students, man. And, 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 and Dorothy, all five foot one of her, all 101 pounds of her were giving out orders that every single one of us I'll follow to the T. Well, now it sounds like you had a lot of mutual support for one another, or at least you did in that instance, yes. uh, her to you. Is it that way or was it that way with a lot of other cases or was this unusual? I think the Buss and Nevers case is unusual. I do think, though, that, you know, we were a very traditional bunch. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, Bob Griffin had been in the United States Senate I don't know, 30 years. I mean, he'd been a long-serving member of the court. Uh, Jim Brickley came to 
the court after having been lieutenant governor, after having been an FBI agent, after having been the United States Attorney General, Detroit City Council, Detroit City Council person, uh, uh, just just really a, a former president of Eastern Michigan University, a profoundly uh, 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 a gifted public servant. Uh, and so, you know, I remember that there was a workers' compensation case uh, written by Brickley that was decided, Bill, in the 1930s. Something to the effect that if the worker was injured out of state and was re-injured in the state of Michigan, that the length of time for the injury would go back to the original because it was a statute of limitations case, something along the lines. And Brickley disagreed with that. He said, look, this is the state of Michigan. What happened in Indiana doesn't, doesn't, doesn't count here. But then he went on to write, but this has been the state of the law since 1930, and I'm not going to upset it now. And he pointed out that this particular question has been reviewed by this court 10 times. And every time it's been reviewed, they say that the Indiana uh, injury counts toward the Michigan uh, statute of limitations. I think that's wrong, but I'm not going to overturn it. The legislature needs to confront this, recognizing that this misinterpretation exists. And he said, but it's instructive to me that in all this time, the state legislature knows that this is the opinion of the court and hadn't done anything about it. That's so-called stare, stare decisis. Stare decisis. Meaning honoring precedent. Honoring the precedent. And it was a profoundly important moment that we all revere now. Uh, uh, and, and, and I don't want to get into a fight with the current court, but I will simply say this, that... There have been courts since I was, uh, 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 after my exit and after uh, uh, Governor Brickley's exit from the court and after Senator Griffin's exit from the well, court. Well, everybody's gone except all, Mike Kavanaugh. He's right. the only one left. And, and, and so the, the, uh, there have been courts that have said, no, the decision is wrong and stare decisis is not necessarily a rule of law, it's more of a legal tradition and we're not going to go down that road. Very different than, than, than what, what has gone well, on. Well, who's right and who's wrong? I think James Brickley is 100% correct. Uh, going back to the admonition given to me by Griffin, the job of a member of the court, among other things, is to protect the institution. Uh, and, and, and I think that in that instance, that was exactly what Jim Brickley was doing. And, and uh, you can so make it. So, all make things a, being equal, there should be deference to past decision making. It is, if that at all is possible. Certainly, my opinion. Yeah. Certainly, my opinion. Okay. Well, let me ask you a couple other things. The Supreme Court itself, we have a peculiar way of doing things here in Michigan, you yeah. know. Uh, we nominate our candidates for the Supreme Court at party conventions, and then they're elected on a nonpartisan ticket in November. Yeah. And, of course, if there is a resignation, as in your case, uh, both when you entered the court and when you left, the governor appoints a successor. Do you think that's a good system? It's been widely criticized. A lot of people say we shouldn't be electing our judges at all. Other people say, well, we should elect them, but in a different way. Other people say we should appoint them and we should appoint them this way or that way or whatever. What do you think? My own view is, is that, I mean, the current system, I think, works, and here's why. Bob Young, who's a member of the court now, was first appointed. Brian Zare, who's a member of the court now, was first appointed. Uh, Steve Markman, who's a member of the court now, was first appointed. Um, I think uh, whoever, whoever takes... Well, Cliff Taylor was appointed and became Chief Justice, was defeated in 2008. Right, so whoever takes Hathaway's case is the point. The That's point right. that I'm making, Bill, is it exists. In more than 50% of the cases, the members of the court are first appointed, then run. Very rarely does a member of the court come to the court from a standing start, nominated by the party, run for election, and then get elected. That almost never happens. The thing that's critical in a Michigan Supreme Court race, and you know this, is the designation, justice. 
90% of the time, the people who elect you are looking to see whether or not they know you, and they assume by the fact that you're on the ballot with justice in front of your name that you meet the minimum qualifications. 99% of the time, their assumption is correct. You've met the minimum qualifications. The governor, having vetted you, and all of these, and, 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 and if tradition holds, and I'm sure that it does, these cases, excuse me, these appointments are first gone through. Uh, the governor uh, uh, consults with the state bar. State bar says qualified or not. Now, sometimes it's minimal qualifications, like in my case, <laughs> they wrote down just barely. <laughs> but but you know, if they really were to write down not qualified, I'm sure the governor would have to really think, rethink the decision sure. that he had made. Uh, but the thing that distresses me is the amount of money, which is why I was very pleased to be a part. In campaigns. In campaigns, which is why I was very glad to be a part of the Association of Supreme Court Justices who uh, put in a brief to the United States Supreme Court who said that at a certain point, money in a judicial race it violates the canons and too much is a bad thing doesn't count with the executive, doesn't count with the legislature, but when you are taking money from a particular party that has a uh, vested, vested interest. interest, then you've got a responsibility either to refuse to take that money, limit the amount, or not hear the case. So, uh, and, the, and, and, and the court agreed with us. Now, they didn't, do, they didn't order that all funding associated with judicial campaigns be shut down, what the court said is, send it back, state legislatures have to make a decision, but at a minimum, if you take money from a particular party and there is on some continuum a point where uh, enough is enough and more than enough is too much, then you can't hear, uh, you're disqualified from hearing the case. That, that, and I was glad to be a part of, of, of the amicus brief that got assigned that. So, I, I think that the work done by Justice Kelly and by Justice Jim slash Ryan. Judge was James Jim Ryan, Ryan? Yeah, who yeah. was on our court and then went to be a federal appeals court right. judge, brilliant man. I, I mean, I don't disagree with their observation that improvements are always possible. The only thing that I would say is, is that a limitation or the public financing of the judicial campaigns uh, would be the way to immunize ourselves from any particular criticism. I think that, uh, uh, y you know, particularly with district court judges, I mean, you know, Bill, I, 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 I want the district court judge to know uh, the people who are standing in front of them. I want them to under I mean, I remember one of my nurses at Sinai Grace, uh, uh, Gwen Navis. Gwen was dropping her kid to school at Farmington Hills. Um, in order to avoid the long line uh, where parents, you know, dropping their kids at school, she drove into the Comerica bank lot and dropped the kid off, and he walked across the grass and into school. So, so now you had two lines, the official line and the unofficial line. Well, Comerica got really upset with people driving into their lot, and I guess they were, you know, wear and tear on the asphalt. I mean, I'm not saying that they were wrong, but anyway, they caused the city to bring a, uh, to give them all tickets. Well, had they been convicted, they'd have been convicted of felony trespass. So it went to the district court judge, and he said, what is this? He said, well, this is the, what school? Oh, yes, the bank, you mean the bank next to the high school? Oh. He said, okay, everybody stand up. All right. You're all uh, convicted of misdemeanor. Pay fifteen dollars and get the hell out of here. That was that, that. That that's why you want an elected district court judge. You got fifty parents in the room, all of whom. Gwen Navis brought me with her because she's a nurse. She get convicted of a felony. She lose her license. This had serious implications. You don't you don't want somebody removed from the community deciding a case like that. You want the judge to say, where is that? Is that Harrison or Farmington? No, Judge, it's, 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 it's the Harris. I'm, excuse me, it's Farmington. Oh, it's the Comerica. You know, I mean, that's literally, he, 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 you know, he made a really derisive sound, made everybody stand up, made everybody go out and pay $15, and then fussed at the city attorney for bringing this particular case and said, don't do that anymore. What's wrong with you?
So, you know, I mean, so, so in a, in a, particularly in a case like that, you know, you want some homegrown justice. I mean, I, you, don't want, you don't want to have a lot of confusion. All right, well, now, in 1992, you're running for a two-year term, and you do have the ballot designation, and you had an opponent nominated by the Republicans. Were you the only one on the ballot this year, that yeah, race? Yeah, yeah. And you won. So won. You, you undoubtedly feel that maybe justice was done in that the ballot designation helped you get and through the And the endorsement the of the news and the free press. There you go. So, it, right. so you the know. newspapers that had said the end of the world was upon us and that this was Blanchard's <laughs> revenge, yeah. in, when, it, when, when the cycle came up, yeah. both newspapers uh, endorsed me. Okay. So you no sooner get elected to the remaining two years, and guess what? Got to run, run again. again. Got to run again. In 1994, you run for a full eight-year term, and this right. time I think there were two Yeah, it was races, me and Don right? Shelton, yeah. and I can't remember. Uh, well, you had uh, young Richard Griffin, didn't you? And, and, and Betty Weaver. And, Betty, and she won. And Betty Weaver. Right. And, and she, you finished first, and right. she finished second, so you were both elected. Right. So what was that campaign compared to 92? Did you feel 90, like it was a walk in the park? Yeah, it, You've no been question. through it once, you know. Yeah, and I kept up the same pace. Yeah. Uh, really, really, really worked hard. And you were the only one of the four major candidates who was an incumbent, who had the ballot designation. Right. So all right. you had to do was finish second. Right. And instead you finished first. So right. you really were solid. Yeah, I, I, and, and worked hard. You know, I mean, I really wanted to, to you know, to, to, to bring this thing home in a yeah. big way. Uh, and, and, and then I do remember being tired for a year. <laughs> Just after the campaign? After the, finally the campaign when there was no more adrenaline left. <laughs> well, you've uh, been campaigning for three years, and, four years, and and you know, beat to death. Yeah, and 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 really remember uh, sleeping in every Sunday till one <laughs> or two o'clock, just exhausted. Well, but look, you must have recovered because you were strong enough, and it made enough of a positive impression on your colleagues that in I guess the end of '86 or, or excuse me, '96 or '97, they elected you chief justice. Yeah. And you'd only been yeah. on the bench at that point like six years. Yeah. And was, it wasn't even necessarily your turn, so it to was speak. Not. So tell me about that. How did that happen? It was Patty Boyle's turn. Uh, the Democrats had a majority. She was next in line. And the, uh, Michael and I both promptly, and Chuck, both promptly went in her office right away uh, and said, uh, Chief, we're with you. Congratulations, and uh, you know, good luck. God love you. And again, it's one of those instances, Bill, where everybody kind of scattered and went home. It was it was the court. Um, uh, it was right around uh, Thanksgiving, and so we were all kind of going home. We were finished. Uh, I don't think we were finished for the year. I think we were going to hear cases in December, but we were, you know, the holidays were 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 there, and people were very distracted. Again, another one of those circumstances where nobody's paying a lot of attention. For whatever reason, uh, the Republican members of the court, Dorothy and Griffin and Brickley, all contacted Patty and said, in an unprecedented manner, we will not support you. Although at that point, technically, it didn't even really make any difference if she voted for herself and the other three of you supported her. Exactly. But it would have been unusual in the sense that it would have created a 4-3 split, which would have been a little bit unseemly or it fractured the collegiality of the court. Right. Why do you think they decided to do that? You know, uh, I, 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 have, I, have, I have some opinions, but uh, out of respect for uh, all three of my Republican colleagues who are no longer here, and Justice Boyle, who is, I won't go into it. Um, it was, uh, uh, to me, an unfortunate uh, moment. Um, um, you, 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 you never want to be seen as taking advantage of a colleague's dislocation. However, once Patty made the profoundly institutionally protective decision to uh, withdraw her name for consideration. Um, so upon hearing this from the three Republicans, she decided, 
I don't want to go there if I don't have unanimous support from exactly. anybody. Okay. Exactly. And so then what? So then um, uh, uh, Dorothy called me and said, I'm going to put your name uh, in nomination, uh, but only if you promise to vote for yourself. I went to see Patty uh, to confirm that she was withdrawing. It was a very uh, crisp meeting. Um, um, uh, and then I called Dorothy back and said I would. And then at that point, uh, I called Chuck and I called Mike. And they said, uh, have you talked to Patty? And I said, yes. Have you confirmed her decision? I said, yes. And they said, OK. Uh, and then uh, uh, I was voted in unanimously as the chief. So everybody basically, at that point, fell into line, yes. even including Patty Boyle. Yeah. OK, was there anything different about your two years as Chief Justice than the preceding six? Well, yeah, you know, because <laughs> I, 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 the, the, I threw myself into the Chief Justice uh, job and... Um, How important is that administratively within the context of the court? You set the tone. You, 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 you run the court. There is an administrative arm. You're responsible for setting the administrative agenda. And I was going to take full advantage of, 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 of my unvarnished commitment during the course of the campaign that I made in both, both of the cycles that there would be serious court reform. And so, you know, I ran all over the state while I was the chief to cause there to be court unification. Uh, we created the family court, which is, I think, one of the profound contributions that my court then uh, can be very, very, very happy about. Uh, going all the way back to uh, former governor and Chief Justice G. Menon Williams and every other Chief Justice since him, uh, there had been a request made by the Michigan Supreme Court to cause there to be a Michigan Supreme Court building. I went to see uh, then-Senator uh, Harry Gast, who was the Senate Appropriations Chairperson. The state, uh, during this really, really, really brief window, was flush with money. And I said, Senator, uh, we'd like to build the building. And he said, you know what? I'm tired of you people coming over here. We're going to give it to you. And he authorized it. And, and, and the state legislature appropriated $70 million for the Michigan Supreme Court building. So on, on my watch, there was created the family court, which merged the probate court, excuse me, which merged the uh, a divorce court and the juvenile court and really created the family court. We couldn't get the probate judges in it. They refused to come. Uh, we caused there to be the further merger of the recorder's court with the Third Circuit Court, because while that had happened bill administratively, there were recorder's court judges who were not being si assigned the civil docket. That ended with, 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 with me as the chief uh, and, and actually saved the career of three or four judges who would simply no longer could do criminal cases because they were just too emotionally overwrought. Uh, uh, and so we, I, I, on my watch, we got some very serious court reform done. We got the building built and got, a, got that all done uh, in two years. Didn't John Engler, who was then governor, support a lot of this? No question. And, yeah, yeah, and there, what there, was the relationship you had personally and that the court had with Governor Engler at that time? You know you what? Remember? We were a separate institution. But it wasn't the, the one person that we had a lot of Congress with was Lucille Taylor, who was the governor's legal advisor. Right. Now, Lucille, was very, Lucille was very, very close to Dorothy. And, and, and I always had a good relationship with Lucille. And she was like me. Uh, the governor's legal counsel and his legislative director. So when we, we, of course, stopped first at her office to get the governor to support uh, 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 Harry Gast. Uh, right. and, and so we had the governor's support for the new building as well. Yeah, so it worked. He was very supportive of the court because Lucille was very supportive of the court uh, uh, because Cliff was very supportive of the court. So it worked out fabulously. Right. Now, 1998 election comes along. The Republicans elect Maura Corrigan, who give them a 4-3 majority on the court. And the next thing we know, Chief Justice Conrad Mallett says, I'm out of here. I'm resigning from the court. Why did you do that? 
I was 45 years old. I had a young family. Uh, and, you know, what I said then was I wanted to spend more time with my family. The truth <laughs> is, the, and which is what the politicians always say. The truth of the matter is, was that the court, for very good reasons, really is very conscious of the financial stability of every member of the bench. You cannot take out loans, non-traditional, you can have a mortgage, you can have a car loan and all those kinds of things, but you can't compromise yourself, Bill, by borrowing money from every Tom, Dick, and Harry who will loan it to you. You can't declare bankruptcy, and the only work that you can do, in addition to the work that you do on the court, is teach and you know what they pay adjunct uh, professors, nothing. Uh, and so the, um, 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 I, I, I won't lie to you or to the people viewing this particular uh, piece, you know, I had financial aspirations for my family that I couldn't meet while I was on the court. And I was 45, a young man, I had enough energy to have a second, excuse me, have a third career. And so I thought that I would take advantage of it. And so the Democrats had two bites of the gubernatorial apple. Right, right. I, I was anxious for there to be the same opportunity for me that had been presented to Dennis Archer, and it never came. Uh, and so I had to make the decision. Your much, dream of coming back to Detroit and running for political office had never materialized because the timing was just always off. Always off. You know, at about that time, the, um, uh, you know, you began to read about George Bush, uh, uh, the, the, the junior, uh, and one of the admonitions that his father had given him was, was, listen, before you run for political office, you've got to secure the financial stability of your family. Well, I had not done that, uh, and so I was going to have to do it in the opposite direction, and so, you know, much to the consternation of uh, my colleagues and a lot of my constituents, uh, I had to exit the court uh, for personal reasons, and you, you know. think you would have been reelected chief justice if you wanted yes. for a second term? No question. Yeah. yeah. So, no question. Uh, but you decided for that reason to exit, and of course that gave Governor Engler an appointment, and of course a lot of Democrats were unhappy with that. Exactly. Uh, because that gave the Republicans this huge five-two majority that they basically had most of the last dozen years. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, what's your opinion? Has the court veered off the rails here uh, with this heavy Republican majority compared to the more balanced court that was in existence while you were there for eight years? You know, while I disagree with a lot of the opinions that the court has written, that's not the troubling uh, factor for me. What has always been troubling to me has been, uh, it's not going on now, but there was a period where the court had turned itself into a serious spectacle mm -hmm. with all of the nutty infighting that was going on. It was deeply disturbing to me to see the institution held up as a caricature of itself. Uh, and I was disappointed in everybody's uh, collective uh, behavior. Um, uh, the court should never come to the attention of the public in that way. Uh, I'm very, 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 very glad that all of that seems to have come to an end and sanity seems to have prevailed. The opinions of the court are the opinions of the court. The, the, the people of the state of Michigan will manage through uh, opinions that you disagree with but at least are thoughtfully uh, uh, reasoned. So, I, I mean, while I would have decided a bunch of these cases differently, the results of these cases, while they're troubling to me as a lawyer and as a citizen, are not indicative of the failure of the court. The court's the court. What I'm relieved at is that the court has returned to the quiet dignity that an institution like that must have in order to function at a high level. Uh, that now being the case, we'll figure it out. You have gone on to a very successful post-court career in health care and health law. Uh, do you ever look back at the days you served on the court with any regret? Do you think everything has turned out pretty well, as well as you might have hoped for when you exited public service at the end of 1998? 
You know, my response to that is, is that, man, I have been so profoundly blessed that I've been going to church with a lot more regularity than I did in the past, just to make sure that God knows I'm grateful, number one. Number two, uh, being a member of the healthcare community allows me also to be a public servant. Uh, and, and so, you know, Bill, you've been doing this public service thing. It really is like a religious calling. You find yourself being glad not to be far away from doing something consequential that affects the lives of people. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to be in the middle of the fury that I'm a part of, grateful to be delivering this kind of public service. The career that I've had could not be, have turned out to me uh, any better. Uh, um, um, uh, I, I was in conversation one time with Bill Schutte, and he was talking with me about being the number two person to Mike Duggan uh, and, and said to me, you know, Connor, do you want to be the mayor of Detroit? You didn't get there. Now you're the number two person of the DMC. Don't you miss being in charge? I said, man, you know, you need to understand the, the I'm one of the best number twos that ever, ever got placed on the face of the earth. And I take a lot of pride and joy uh, in that. I've been given great leadership opportunity. President of Sinai Grace Hospital, the largest hospital in the DMC system, had a really, really, really successful run there. And, and, and I say to people all the time, the Lord has let me go to the mountaintop twice. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, so I'm really, really happy about that. And then the other thing is, is that as I look back on it, the, the, on the court, if you care to compromise, you can. I can always, Bill, decide to sign your opinion. And I can go to you and I can say, uh, Justice Ballinger, if you will change sentence five in paragraph three, I'll sign the opinion. So you and I compromise over language. Other days, I might say, you know what, Justice Ballinger, I completely and totally disagree. I can't sign your opinion. I'm going to write my own. And that's that, and and you say God love you, and 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 uh, go off and and do a good job. It's the highest form of public service there is because I choose the result that I want to associate myself with as a legislator or as an executive. The expectation is that you will compromise. As a member of the court, the expectation is is that you will always do only that which you believe is intellectually honest. Man, that's the greatest, I, I mean, who else in political life is that the standard against which they are judged? You're only gonna do what you, what you believe to be intellectually honest. I've had the greatest opportunity there is, you know, and, and uh, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for it and uh, please. Justice Mallett. Thank you, my friend. I hope this is the standard for a good interview. I think it was. <laughs> Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much.